assumption I make, I don't know what's in his okay, mind. Okay. Because he was always a decent guy, but I just felt it. They weren't, they, they, there wasn't a reception. So what I learned as, as a journalist is that, I was just saying there was a young, a young reporter earlier, that my job evolved, even at the AP, when I began to get critical of the war and the lies about the bombing and the lies about McNamara. My job consisted of taking a dead rat full of lice, been killed by, by lice and other bugs, vermin, uh, uh, the plague, and going into my editor's desk, his office, and dropping it on his desk and saying, here, Mr. Editor of the AP or uh, the New York Times or the New Yorker magazine, here's my next story. I want to write about this rat full of, full of uh, plague. And um, I, it's going to cost you a lot of money because I'm expensive. I fly around. <laughs> and, 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 and my success rate on stories like this is about 40%. So the odds of two out of five, I won't, I'm going to come back and spend 100,000 bucks at the Creon and business class um, and um, Creon in Paris. When I first joined the Times, they sent me the first day, they sent me to cover, that's another story, but the, I had no idea what the life was like at the New York Times. The Creon's a five-star hotel. And I, I flew overnight in business class on Air France, which is lovely. And I went to the hotel, and I, I was up all night. I wanted the orange juice, and it cost something like $14 in US dollars for a glass of orange juice. I said, what is the New York Times doing? Money was no object. They made money so much that um, the, uh, the publishers had a rule, only 1.5% to 2% profit. Everything above that went back into the paper, salaries, travel. And look at it now. It's dying. Um, well, I, when I wrote this memoir about which I didn't want to do, I didn't want to do the memoir, but I had to because I couldn't do a book on Cheney. Well, that's the question. But let me let me okay. go let me go back to okay. the story I was about the dead rat. And so, what I learned was, I would say to the editor, "There's a good chance the story won't work, and if you do get the story, you're going to hate it. It's going to cost a lot of money to check it. You have to talk to everybody I talk to without me." It's complicated sometimes. It means you have to send a checker on the road sometimes to see somebody who doesn't want to talk on the phone. So you spend a lot of money checking it. It's a very good system. I don't think it's, they can afford to do it as well now. The London Review did the same thing. They never spent that much money on the story. And um, um, <laughs> I started writing for the London Review because I had trouble at the New Yorker. And she was great, Mary Willens, who runs it, Mary Kay Willens, this old, wonderful old lady, this dame, brilliant dame. And I discovered that 90% of the American reporters thought the London Review was one of these tabloids you get at the subway in New York when full of ads, the free paper. Yeah, they had no, that's Metro. They had no, like Metro. They had no idea what it was. It was very depressing. But anyway, and so you say to the editor, um, okay, here's this dead rat. Suppose they get the story. It's going to cost a lot more money to check it. You're going to have to send somebody maybe to Europe to talk to somebody who talked to me without me there. And then... Um, uh, every law firm in New York is going to sue you. It's usually about oil companies, you know, the horrible things they do. And, and then when you publish it, you're definitely going to get sued. So here's what I'm giving you. Well, that good, that's good for a couple of years. But after a couple of years, they're really tired of dead rats. So I understand that. So I don't hold editors responsible for basically not wanting to run my stories or make it harder for me. I just don't. So that's why I do what I'm doing now. I, I'm uh, I write books, to, and I would have written a good book about Cheney. That's my question. What happened to this book? How many years did, have you worked on this well, book? Well, I was doing Cheney all along. Mm -hmm. I, I had, <coughs> over the years, I met people, and Cheney, Cheney's not dumb. Uh, I would argue Trump's not dumb. The difference between Cheney and Trump is immense. Um, most importantly, um, uh, Cheney reads. Trump doesn't. Cheney also has an ability. He has a wife. He has children. Cheney does not connect in any visceral way that we know of. He's just what he is. And I don't know why we're surprised. We, there's, you know, would you buy a used car from a real estate salesman? You know, that's what you're going to get. But to underestimate him, that it happens. He's dangerous. It's very dangerous. He ran a campaign in which the best thing that happened to um, John Stewart, who was the show he used to have on the nightly John Stewart. Um, what late now? When John Stewart, when he announced he's for the president, John Stewart was still doing it. He was in heaven. 
my God, this guy is going to make my job so easier. But what did he do? He took down 15 professional politicians in the next year. <coughs> once had somebody check it for me. They had 295 years of being a professional, either in, in the State House, the Senate, public life. 295 years of experience. He had Zippo. He, he took down two dynasties, the Bushes and the Clintons. And he took down... So, don't write him off easy. I mean, that you doesn't believe mean, he's going to be reelected. Oh, unless the Democrats suddenly change the color of their skins. They're, they're very much, the Democrats are very much like the French and D&B and Fu. <laughs> they lost, she lost the election by spending the last two months selling everybody who thought, how could any moderate Republican and moderate independent, and you've got to understand America, here's what makes America so uniquely crazy. There are two parties, the Democrat and Republican. And between the two of them, 95, 96% of the electorate know they're either a Democrat or Republican. There's 4% that are too friggin' dumb to know which party they're in. And they're the ones that decide the elections. And they're the ones that everybody looks at. They all say, can we get the independent vote? <laughs> and I always think, there's nothing more crazy than the 4% of the people who don't, don't know what party they're in because they haven't thought about it. You know, it's not hard to decide one party is different than the other. Anyway, so, <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> the question was, what happened to this book? Why oh, wasn't it published? The original question was, I, I knew book? someone, Cheney was a reader. He stunned the hell out of everybody one day. There was a discussion about the Middle East and Israel. And he, he started citing the 1917 Balfour Declaration, which is a, this document that was the first time that the British were going to isolate the, 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 uh, the, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, the Jews, let's just put it that way. Palestine. The Palestinians, they were going to isolate them. And um, um, they weren't necessarily the Zionists, they weren't, they were, it was then very early. And you didn't have this mad Zionist thing that you still have now. I, I consider it a very detrimental what's happened in Israel. The whole Zionist. Because they were all Russians. What? They were all Russians in, in Israel. It changed the democracy, the inflow of, of, of Russians, because they couldn't care less about it's, democracy. It's, it, the you Russians are unbelievably racist. You know that. But there's no society. The Ashkenazi Jews, mm -hmm. in terms of their attitude towards the Sephardic, the Arab Jews, yeah. are you kidding? The most racist thing going. The, 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 the Israel was always totally, the, unless you were, if you were an Eastern European Jew, you were an exalted status. The, Arab, the, the Jews of Morocco, go watch some of the Israeli movies. They're very good. Very funny about the racism of the society. And the Russians just come in and they're just racist, period. So, you know, the society is like a, like a mad place. And where is it going to go? I don't know. I don't know where it's going to go. Where is me? Brooklyn. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, so we should, somebody must have a question there that outside uh, of One last question. And so you wrote this. Oh, so yeah. there were guys. Cheney was bright enough to bring in very good people from the, from the bureaucracy to work for him sort of a kitchen cabinet. These are very smart people. And Cheney was smart enough to know what he didn't know. And he, you know, he was Secretary of Defense, and he was, a very, he was very conservative, but he was a very decent secretary. He met every two weeks with all the generals, the four stars, and he was open. And some of the people that worked for him, I, I used to deal with as a reporter when he was Secretary of Defense. If you remember the first Gulf War, the one in which even um, uh, Hassan uh, Bashar, father's, Bashar, father, uh, Bashar Assad's father joined with us mm -hmm. in, in the first Gulf War. Assad, Assad did not. Mm -hmm. And so the Arab world was there. And um, in that war, the Iraqi military completely collapsed. Even the Republican Guards, the tank groups. And, um, and they ran away from the American forces. They were in Kuwait. And there was a highway of death. You remember that? Yes. And Cheney wanted to stop very quickly. On one of the main grounds is they're slaughtering people. Secondly, the American pilots were flying low and just shooting. And he thought it was nothing. You, know, you would destroy these guys a couple of days of just mowing down people. The, the psychological, he was sort of interesting in that. So I sort of, I didn't dislike him, but I thought he was a rational person. And he was okay, a hawk. But 9-11 turned him over, turned him an Islamofascist. And he also was instinctively anti-communist. And so... Um, 
the people, he brought in some people that worked for him that had been in the community for many years because he did want to listen to outside advice. Um, they kept him, you could argue they kept him from going to Iran. He always wanted to go to Iran, which is still the American dream, destroy Iran. Never mind the consequences. Um, and um, so these people after 9-11, some of them I knew, uh, weren't terribly helpful to me in, pro in their prior life, but they were retired, but they were still in. That's how it is. If you're very smart on the inside and you come from a, a, a family full of four-star generals and admirals and a long military career and you had a career in the military and you also family happens to be very wealthy and you're accepted in society and all that, you're in. And so they would still be players. And even Trump has, Mattis comes from Mattis, which he doesn't like to advertise, the general who's the most rational guy in his government, his, fashion, his passion is classical Greek. He reads it and he writes silly poems to his friends. And there are a lot of people in the American military, military people are strange. It's, you know, it's a strange way to spend your life. And many of them, um, some of the Marines in particular, who really wanted to be Jesuit priests, but ran into women. And they, they joined the other priesthood, which was the Marine Corps. Marine Corps are always, they just, there's a war, they, they don't stand around like the army and firing rockets and then go in. They go in with boots on the ground and kill and be killed. I mean, it's just crazy. Anybody wants to be a Marine, I don't know what to think. Semper Fi, they say, Semper Fi. They're just different. I was, they terrified me, the Marines. Is this a, I, the army was great because we were trained to shoot rockets and then watch and see what happened. You know, and disobey orders if they wanted to put you in danger. You said, well, I'm not going to do that. You know, that was, that was our training in the army. Not to go in there and die. And so it's a big difference. Anyway, um, so I began dealing with them. And after eight years, there's a photograph of me that was in the paper last week of my office. What was the name of that paper? That, the Nove Nove. There was a photograph, the last Saturday's edition, of my office full of stacks of, of, of folders, because I learned right, <coughs> right after 9-11, I learned right after 9-11, I learned that Cheney had ordered all of the rules about, uh, the American rule was uh, for the signals and community, the in intercept people, like the GCHQ, and we call it the National Security Agency, you could not copy an American, unless you get a warrant. You have to listen and have enough evidence to get a warrant from a judge from something called the FISA court. It's just against all, he dropped all of that. So I, I knew within um, two months of 9-11 that I could put nothing in a computer, nothing. So I began to keep notes and do indexes. And so I had this body of information. It's on the desk there, the photograph in the mag. It's a great photograph, I'd never seen it before. I think it was cropped. It was a New York Times photograph and they cropped that side out. And they, your, the newspaper from a news service probably paid a couple hundred bucks to get the original picture. Maybe more, I don't know. It's a, it's a service they provide. And so um, Obama gets in and I start doing more intensive interviews with these people about what, what happened. The inside story, there's always two stories. The story you tell the American people and the inside story. They don't differ necessarily in the results, but uh, the thought I had was, we have something called the Constitution. And I realized that eight or nine neoconservatives, uh, Cheney was a neoconservative, Paul Wolfowitz, Rumsfeld, there were eight or nine of them. Within three or four months of 9-11, they had overthrown the Constitution. They were just, they were running the torture prisons without going to Congress. They set up bank accounts around the world. How did they convince Bush? Cheney didn't speak to him. Cheney did. Don't forget Bush, within a week of 9-11, talked, what was that wonderful word he used? Um, um, going back, uh, he used a wonderful word um, about, um, about the, um, the same word, the, 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 the Catholics, uh, the Knights of Malta used. Crusade. Yes. He used crusade in a speech seven days afterwards. And crusade, they meant crusade, because there were religious zealots in the special forces, and they saw going after the Iranian, uh, the, the Muslim world, as 
they saw themselves as Knights of Malta, uh, 13th century uh, crusaders going after the infidels, not knowing that the history said that the rivers, you know, the, the river in, in the, the famous river in uh, Baghdad would soon be red with their blood. <laughs> but they didn't know that part of it. And so they saw it as a crusade, it was a religious movement. And so some of these guys in the inside who were very bright began to talk to me. They stayed there. And so for eight years I was writing stories that were spectacular. I mean, I was, uh, uh, you know, Abu Ghraib and I knew, I knew stuff. And so afterwards I started to write. And Obama, which people don't, Obama got very, in the second term, got very tough on leaks and cracked down. And so I would, by three or four years I had chapters and believe me, anything sensitive I made sure my people saw. Um, I would deliver it to them at night, at home, um, uh, you know, like a little delivery boy. And they would read it, and they were honorable. I never had any trouble. Nobody ever leaked anything. And um, it was important to do. Fact-checking for the New Yorker was a safety mechanism, because my story sometimes took months. And I would talk to somebody who worked for Cheney, or who worked in the White House, and they would use a phrase to me in April of 2004, and I would write the story maybe three months later. I, I spent months on stories. It was the one that was called long-form journalism. You can't afford it now. I can't afford it. Nobody would pay the kind of money I was, I, was, I was being paid enough to live on and do it. Um, because those are the days before the crash in 2008 when media had coverage. You're all missing something. You're missing wonderful magazine and long-form journalism because you cannot afford it anymore. And that's why it's all, that's why Trump's a winner. Tweets are stories. God forbid you should take something and spend three weeks working on something and see what's really happening inside. How we're all being screwed by the plutocrats who run the government now. They're all just a bunch of rich guys who take care of their rich friends who run corporations. So you can make cars less safe. You can pass rules and diminish safety stuff because it's helping out your buddies. None of that's reported as much as it could. Anyway, so these guys liked it because one phrase, and I won't repeat it because it's, one, one guy used a phrase in an interview with me in, in April, let's say. I would see him again, but he used that phrase in April. And I cited it in an article that was going to be published in um, early July. And a week earlier, he'd used the same phrase at a meeting. A cliche. You know, one, you know, and mattress mice was one. It means the little bureaucrats who get in the way of the big boys who want to do things illegally. And they would be felt, oh my God, thank God I got a chance to see this because I take out that phrase because it would identify them. So there was a safety in it, a very subtle safety. And so Obama began to crack down. Some he tried in public. Some just were forced out by leaks. So they said, we can't do it now because two things. To be as specific as you have to be. If I write a bank about a bank account in a foreign country, I damn well better know what I'm saying. I better know what bank, who was responsible. In most cases, it was people like the prime minister or the chief of economics, because they were also getting paid under the cover, you know, a percentage of money. And we were financing the, the black prisons, the prisons in Lithuania, all the torture stuff. Off the books, Congress didn't know. And later, the, the senior people in Congress told me they knew they didn't know, but they were afraid to ask, Democrats always afraid. So I couldn't do the book. And by this time I had taken uh, a lot of money from my publisher. And so I said, so do you want my wife or my youngest son? What do you want? What's the deal? <laughs> and uh, Sonny Mehta, who's this brilliant editor, the most, there's editors in this Sonny Mehta. He's, he's visual. I don't know whether it's because he was born in India or not. I just don't know. But he's, he's a different man. He said, do a memoir. I said, not a chance. He said, do a memoir. And so I, that's how I did the memoir, in lieu of that book. But um, I'm still in debt, you know, because I'll do the Cheney book, but not, I couldn't do it now because Trump is too vicious. He would be bad, even though it has nothing to do with Trump. I don't like Trump, but I also, I also think the Democrats are making a big mistake. If they think they can take the House and start doing investigations of again, they're going to they're going to bury themselves. They're do, they're going to do the same thing Hillary did. What did she say? Here's Hillary. It was the worst candidate. She falls. She lies. She does this. 
Her eyes open up. She can't. She's too. She's quite pleasant privately, but on the campaign trail, she's a terrible speaker. Her husband's gifted, and so she makes up for it by opening her eyes and screeching. She gives the worst speeches, and so you have to think. At some point, you have to say, "Well, let's look at Trump for a minute." And she starts talking about Trump two months before the election. Anybody that looks at him, they're the, the, the deplorables. So every time she spent the last two months of the campaign telling everybody what a bad person Trump was. And that's what they want to do again. They're going to lose. Because a lot of people like the bad people, the bad Trump. Rural America loves him enough to win elections, to keep the Senate. Lose the House. But what does he care? He knew that was going to happen. He's kept the Senate, although he might lose it. He might only buy one or two seats, but he still kept the Senate, which was the big job. And he's still going to be president. And the Democrats are going to be like little nets at his toes. And he's got some game plans for after the next year. He's got some game plans. The last thing, everyone's obsessed with Trump. That's all they speak to you. All they, well, I'm so happy to come here. He's not in headlines. Yeah. I, went, I went, I had to go to London in, in, uh, uh, in, in March, for a, couple, for a week or two longer than I've been gone. Such a pleasure not to have a headline with Trump every day, not to see him on news every day. We're sodden with him. Why? Why do we do Trump? Because the New York Times, the Washington Post, and MSNBC and CNN, in their hostility to Trump, draw audiences. The yes. cable companies have doubled their ratings. The New York Times are getting 200,000 more online subscribers every three months with their negative about Trump. And it's okay to be negative about Trump, but not about the tweets and not about the dumb stuff. Go write about what's happening to the environmental laws, how it impacts. I mean, they do do it, but that should be the focus every day. What is he doing to America, you know? You can't get him overseas because for reasons having to do the fact that he's a hotel man, he doesn't like war. And he's probably, he sent a general to Afghanistan, not knowing anything about him. But there's smart people, like Mattis, who want that war over. And he sent a general, who's really quite bright, from Special Forces, who's talking to the Taliban. That's the ticket out. So we're going to do it. We'll make a deal with the Alpha Taliban. Why not? Get out of that war. Right now they're killing them. Our, our, the Taliban, our, our soldiers that we train are killing Americans. We, we created the Taliban. Well, no, they were there. We made, we made them bigger and better. I think it's time for some questions. Sure. I really think so, and I like... Do, do we have a microphone? Like, Anybody have a question? Questions, or you don't questions? Want to get it? And we by the way... a microphone here? It is, it is very late. It is almost midnight, and you're free to walk out and go home to your babysitter. You can't walk out to your party. We, have, we have food for you. A journalist... A, I talked to a journalist only today. We have a, we have a, a journalist from here yeah. who looked at this and he said, Oh my God, you're going to be speaking in an aquarium. Like I'm like I'm a fish. I'm floating here in water. It's the strangest place I've ever speak, but it, it's sort of nice. It's okay. Question. Let's go. We'll do a couple. And we'll let you go right here. What's the basis um, in the in the microphone? Sorry. Uh, why were President Obama's domestic surveillance policies so similar to what was rejected by Congress when Nixon wanted the same thing? Do you understand beauty? No. Beauty. Beauty does it all. If you're beautiful, you can get away with anything. He's beautiful. He was beautiful. He talked wonderfully. Um, I wrote a long thing that became a small book oh, that's back there about, <coughs> about what really happened with the killing of bin Laden. The way they did bin Laden is um, he had a news conference late at night after, after everybody announcing for hours as an important announcement and sort of leaking it out. And by, the, by from 8 o'clock to 11 o'clock, the audience for news was probably 50, 60 million on the Sunday night. They leaked out it may be about Bin Laden, and he came out and he said, we got him, right? We got him, right? One of the people said that. Anyway, the point being that America, there were thousands of people came to the White House lawn outside to the park across the street. The, the war on terror was over. We killed Bin Laden, and it's all done. This wonderful notion that the way you respond to a criminal attack is to clear a war on the people had nothing to do with it, the Taliban, and then generally a war on, on an idea. I mean, that one, that's going to go down as the all-time dumb move. But anyway, um, uh, um, in that case, uh, he got away with it. 
for weeks. He was he was the hero who killed Bin Laden, and the fact that it had nothing to do with the war and terror, and he was a prisoner, was just a minor problem. <coughs> and he got away with it in a way no other president could. Uh, FDR could about World War World War Two maybe, but Johnson couldn't get away with his lies um, because he wasn't pretty enough. Kennedy was pretty and got away with them. Um, so um, uh, I, I just think it's in the eye of the beholder. I really do believe. Uh, uh, Obama was, he could cry at, at church meetings. He was just a, very, and he was, he knew philosophy, he was bright. And I know that sounds idiotic to you, but believe me, um, uh, uh, he's gonna be the role model for politicians of the future. Uh, please don't put words in my mouth. Uh, well, I guess what I meant was that uh, there were specific policies that Nixon had in mind, and the fusion centers are very similar to them. And I'll leave the microphone to the next person. Uh, so you were the American military? Uh, no. Well, no why way. do you know about fusion centers? Uh, I read about them on the internet somewhere. I don't know. I read Chris Hedges. Uh, Chris or, Hedges is great. But I don't, Chris Hedges wouldn't write about fusion centers are. In, uh, in, sorry. You know, uh, it's inside baseball stuff. That's good. I'm, I'm, I'm interested. Anyway, go ahead. But I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I just want to answer your question. Oh, well, yeah, you, about, I don't think what you said was idiotic. Uh, I was just wondering about the institutional continuity between what Nixon wanted and what Obama did. Uh, did it go through Cheney and Rumsfeld? Is that where the... I mean, no, I mean, just, no, no, just, uh, they just never stopped. The programs never stopped. And nobody ever looked at Obama that way as they looked at others. He was given a pass. The media was so happy to have somebody that was pretty. He had a wife that wasn't totally disengaged and hostile. It wouldn't matter because he was black. That played, it must have played a very large part. Well, in the, in the liberal pressure. Yes. But there were a lot of people who didn't like him for being black. So the answer to your question is A, it's probably not answerable. But B, I mean, not without a long sort of rambling discussion about which I know nothing. I would just give you an opinion. Let's have another question. So Thank I, you. I, I just don't another know. Another question. But, you know, the answer is he, he, was, he was what he is. Uh, hello. Three short questions. No, only one. Only one? You're, okay. I leave the two for two. You're not even. Okay, one. You're, you're not even, a, you know. One. I mean, How come? You're, 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 you're from South Asia. How dare you think you can ask three questions? No problem, no problem. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> How come nobody saw the corpse of uh, Bin Laden? Oh, I don't, I think it was just destroyed on site. I think it, the, the Navy SEALs came in and they had no discipline. They all put a, they all put a magnet. They all put a magazine in him. He, his body was torn to shreds. The bill, the, you have to understand the bullets the SEALs use. I've talked about this. They're bullets that are devised when they hit a bone. They spin, destroying mass. Dum -dum and they're, they're dum dum bullets, but dum -dum. And they use those SEALs. So he, he was, uh, there were f six SEALs who went up to kill him. And only one was supposed to do the shooting. And if you remember, in the various memoirs, everybody claimed they were the one that killed him because they all shot him, five of the six. The other one was watching the door. So it was an ugly cop. It wasn't much of it, my okay. understanding. Am I allowed the second question? It was a simple question, yes. How naive was Khashoggi to come back to the embassy, knowing that he's expected the second time? No, 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 you don't get it. He was in love. Well, I'm in love she when I see him go she, in order, She said in order, to, in order to go back, you have to get that document, so it's a legal marriage. He can send an office boy. Yes, more than that. She he could not it. bother with the process. Just marry her. Which, Last question. So, but, but the point is, why did he go back in? Because I they were waiting for him there to kill him. That's why. Yeah, he looked for it. I mean, he was no, looking he look for it. He had no idea. She did. Why she did she go in with it? She convinced him. I don't want well, I just... I'm, I have a couple of facts that I know. My last question. I will tell you that also one of the facts I know Ergun talked about. He talked about the photographs. There were photographs. He did have he was killed right away. He wasn't beheaded. He was just killed. Did they roll him up on a rug? I don't know what they did. But you know, only the Saudis would think we could do a clandestine murder by f flying two men in a private jet. With, with Saudi markings and landed at the airport and go through customs and have your picture taken. The, the, the incompetence of this as a murder it was, it's titillated the, uh, the intelligence communities all over the world. The Saudis are 
you know, when it comes to uh, modern day assassination, they should just go back to the guillotine. What they do is they cut throats and hang them upside down, all over eastern, you know, in the eastern portion, where where the the, the Shia are, the Shia who do the work in the fields. When they have descent there, they will cut, they will get a dissenter and they will cut his throat and hang him upside down and bleed him out in a square. Like a they still do it. Go ahead. My last question. You got all three in, you see? <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> did you ever heard, did you ever hear of a coup d'etat that starts at 21 hours in the evening? And I mean Istanbul. No. So it was doomed to fail. You mean the, the coup that took place? Yeah, against Erdogan. No, it wasn't doomed, you know. I wouldn't start it at 21 hours. Uh, uh, there's a lot of tells. One of the tells is, uh, I use that word, if you play poker like I used to in the army on payday and lose my money in two minutes, it's when you get a good hand and you raise your eyebrows. One of the tells is he couldn't fire many four stars because they were all in it, which made it even stupider. That even the four stars were all in it and he couldn't coordinate it in such a way that there was a, he had an hour to escape by plane. He was supposed to be blown out of the sky, but they got the timing wrong. So I don't know what to tell you about the the, uh, um, uh, the Americans and the Brits have, don't have a high opinion of the uh, of the Turkish army, just like they don't have a high opinion of other armies. You know, the uh, uh, um, most notably, uh, well, they make fun of other armies, but um, the French army in particular. Go ahead, Frank. You want to speak? You have a question, Frank Kuznick. You're Bob Mueller, your days are numbered. All of a sudden, what are you doing right now to make sure that all the work that you've done doesn't go to waste? Well, there's a real issue about how much he has. Bob Mueller, the, the special investigator. And it's not clear that the appointment that he's made as the new attorney general, they're gonna have to back down off that. Yes. It's so much higher. He's gonna have to recuse himself. And Mueller's tough, he's been around. And um, um, the charter he has doesn't really call for him to make a report even, but he'll do one. My problem is I don't think he can do much with Trump, even the paying off the girls. I mean, we have a precedent. Bill Clinton paid off whom, how many hookers before he became president? And so that all happened before he got to the White House. I think his son-in-law, who seems to be uniquely opaque, thinking that he can, that somehow he can get a deal with, with the, with, uh, in, in Ramadan with the Palestinians, by money with business, I mean something, not understanding anything about pride. Uh, he did, he made a deal in Qatar. He had a, 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 <coughs> a large property they bought that was a losing venture and he unloaded it, well, it was a billion dollars plus and the Qat Qatar bought it. And that seems to be, that was seven months after the presidency, that's actionable. That, that, but, and so the president could be named as unindicted co-conspirator. The, 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 the Russian case he's not going to make. It's not, gonna, it's not there. It's just, I'm sorry, it's not there. I know you'd love it to be there, you, you, you in this wonderful country, but it's not there. It's just not there. That doesn't mean he didn't hatch. It's just not there. They just don't have it. And so, I don't know what they're going to get. Um, you know, Trump's the kind of guy that could go to Russia. I don't know if he had golden showers. I'm not sure the steel thing is that reliable. The, F, the MI6 guy. But I do know he took a lot of money from them. But you know, one of the things we, the CIA learned is in the 50s and 60s, we went around buying people. In the classic case I knew about firsthand from people. In India, we bought Raji Desai, we bought 50, 50 or 60 different politicians, 20,000 a year. And it turned out when you asked them to do something, they said, we don't care about your money, we're gonna do what we want anyway. So you really don't buy people. And the fact that the Russians would lose all sorts of money in real estate investments with him, um, uh, I, I, I'm not sure that's gonna be enough to prove that he was beholden to Russia in any profound way. And so I just don't, I don't see it. I don't, I don't know what he's gonna get, but I don't know. He's looked at the tax returns I know very early and he did, there, I, there's no sign he got much out of that. And, and he's brought a couple of cases about, one of the cases about the internet the internet operator in St. Petersburg, who was running trolls, that's gone away. Because the, uh, 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 because the owner of that company, the one that knew the cook, chef that was close to Putin, 
what was the connection that made him be somehow a monster. He came into America, hired a very brilliant lawyer that had been high, a high government official in private practice in Washington, and said, you know what, Mr. Mueller, I accept jurisdiction. You didn't think I would. You know, they, 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 the argument was you, they'll never accept jurisdiction. It was an indictment made. There'll never be a court case. And he ended up running away from the case. Mueller did. He, he tossed it to a U.S. attorney's office. So I don't know what he has. I don't think there's, you know, and Trump's paranoia about it is, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean he's that frightened of it. He's, you know, he's against anybody that is an enemy. I just, I could be wrong. There could be, he could be named in indictments. But the, the people I know that are inside a little bit, um, they're not sure that it's going to be overwhelming. He may be an unindicted co-conspirator in some of his son-in-law's dealings with, with the Qatar, some of his dealings with the hotels where a lot of foreign missions stay in his hotels. There may be, it's, a, it's against the Constitution, the emoluments. So there may be something like that, but I don't think it's going to be impeachable. I don't think it's going to rise to the level of high crimes. It's just going to be the usual crap. I'm sorry to say that, but if I had a bet, I'd bet he's not going to get indicted. He's not going to be impeached. He's going to be here, and he's probably going to win re-election unless the Democrats start running. Yeah, I know it's a terrible thought. It is a terrible thought. I mean, it's... Any more? A question here? To your right. Thank you, sir. Uh, is President Trump's attitude toward the press corps, toward the press, uh, something fundamentally different from the president who came before him, as seems to be the conventional wisdom? Or is it just being covered differently, and it's basically the same attitude that Nixon had, that LBJ had, and it's just covered differently in the digital oh, oh, age, I guess? Oh, if you want to put it in another way, he's just more honest. You know, you're all bums and I hate you. Um, but advocating violence is a step too far. When he goes and he, he, he and and reporters have told me about people going up to them at rallies, going like this, and so he's he's advocated. That's been a big mistake, a big step forward, and um, and uh, that's why you know in so many ways he's such a disagreeable and uh, inadvisable president. And to the point there's. I could maybe know enough to maybe write something about Mueller's problems, but I'm just not interested in writing anything right now that would give him a day in the sun. It's, am I right? I don't have to write every story I want. I'm not, I'm not you know, if I don't think there's any social value in the story, and let, let Trump worry about it. Um, and, and if I have a fact, I'm, you know, there's some things he's done. I will tell you some of the things that, that are done in his name because he doesn't pay attention. There's some thoughts going on. Uh, it's like he, he hasn't started a war. He talks big. Uh, he took Kim of North Korea to Singapore. And by the way, if there's going to be a Nobel Prize, it's going to go to Moon of South Korea. There's been at least, I, that I can count, four uh, conferences, international peace conferences between North and South Korea in the last tw uh, two, uh, tw uh, 20 years, two decades. And in every case, the South was much more hostile to an agreement you could argue that the South was extremely hostile to as much as the North. And Moon, for the first time, is somebody who really wants to make it work. He wants to, he wants to end this craziness of the 38th peril. And so you could say, and so I've had people, there are some rational people on the fringe. I mentioned Mattis, and he's surrounded by some ra rational people. That you could say that one thought of going, just taking him to Singapore, you know, there's a, there's a financial crisis in the North. They have no money. They're in great debt. They, they, you know, they, they, they can't sell. Their, they don't have much to sell, but, you know, they're in a huge constant a negative flow. You know, people don't eat as well as they should there, et cetera, et cetera. And so you show them Singapore, which is like a boy's version of Megalopolis in, in, a, in a Superman movie. You know, um, one high rise after another, no bubble gum. Remember, you, you, if you, you, would, you would be arrested if you spit gum out. And what's he doing by showing him that? Well, he's doing two things in, in his eyes. He's showing Trump, and he's, he's, Trump is telling, literally, he's saying to Kim, hey, you've got great beaches. Just look at it. Suppose you could have a, a huge, millions of people, like 
Uh, I'm sure many people in this country would like three or four of the visitors to go to North Korea every year. That you, get, you have too many of them. Uh, you could have great beaches. You could have condos. You could have casinos like I ran. Instead of a big field in the middle of Pyongyang where the military march, you could build a great football stadium and have the World Cup maybe there and have tourism, big hotels. and be, Look what's here. And that's what he was saying. But there were people behind him that were saying, if you want to think about it in different ways, and there are smart people in governments, even in a crazy government like this, they don't necessarily aren't in the inner circle. This is a message to Tehran, too. We know you don't have bombs, even though we say yes. We know you don't. The American community has been reporting that constantly for 15, 20 years. And Trump finally is convinced. No bombs. So I'm not going to kiss your ass. But why don't you kiss mine a little bit in public, and then we'll become friends. And that's the message. It's not going to happen, because he has no understanding of the culture. But the idea is he's, you know, if, if they want to invite me, Homani, and treat, you know, treat me as nicely as I get treated, you know, and I don't have to have gold rooms, uh, I'll go. So there's a certain openness that's a little crazy. I don't, and so it's not all madness. It is on his part, but there are people around. And that was the thinking of some of the people, why it was very useful to go to Singapore. Because let Tehran, they're, they're having money troubles. And so what has he done in the last week? You notice he's delayed the sanctions on 85, 85% of it, even Turkey. Why has he done that? He's, done that. <coughs> he's letting them buy Iranian oil. Iranian have about 4 million barrels they can produce a day on the market. They're only selling 2.4, and they're selling a lot of it to, uh, to China uh, and the Far East at discount. He's saying, well, let them sell more oil, and because the price, the American, uh, the, the bench part, Mark Price in America has gone over $80. And we're paying four and a half dollars in many places, four dollars, more than four thirty-nine for a gallon of regular gas. And we were paying two something a couple years ago. So he's a very short-term domestic-minded person. All of this talk about sanctions and Iran and I'm not going to go with the treaty. He's also saying, well, you can sell a million, putting a million and a half more barrels on the market and drive the price down. It's now down to $59 instead of 86 Drive it down a little more because, you know, he's going to be running for president. And he'd like to be able to say, I've got you back to $2.50 a gallon oil. And so there's, it's, he's doing right in front of everybody. And the press today is all full of screaming and yelling about Florida and tweets and about this new guy. And you have to go to the business page to see that the, the benchmark Mark price for oil is going down. And he's let 80, all this talk about sanctions, he's waving them to let the Iranians sell Iran make more money. What does he care? It's all short term for him. And so, um, uh, uh, and uh, I'll also say, in the last week, he got a very good economic reading. And his thinking about that, I know it's hard to think he thinks, um, but his thinking about that was, in the last week, he didn't campaign on economics largely. He still talked about the threat from immigrants. This is saying terrifying threat that worked clearly for many people. I mean, he, he held the Senate. And in rural America, he was very strong. If you look at a map of blue and red, I mean, it's, 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 all, it's all red. It's all, you know, the, the, all of America. The, I think the senators up for election, uh, the, the 18 senators represented something, uh, the 12 senators represented 18% of the population. The two senators from North Dakota have as much power as the two senators from New York. I mean, it's a strange system in America. And so... Well, that's not enough to get him reelected. I mean, you don't get reelected in North Dakota. No. Um, but he does have a plan that he's going to announce early next year, after the new Congress is sworn in. He's got a plan. Just remember you heard he's got a plan. That's all I can say. I, I don't want to violate a confidence. Another question? But no, I just finished one okay. more thought. He didn't run on the money stuff. Why did he run on the money stuff? Because he knows that the economy was only went for the good one and a half percent. The working class, even the farmers that voted for him, aren't doing better. Most Americans are doing about three percent less. So the the increase in the economics doesn't he knows that. Doesn't mean he doesn't brag about it. 
So hate him for what he does, using fear and speaking the way he does. But don't underestimate him, Democrats. He does think. You may not like it, but he does think. Okay, last question. Uh, Mr. Hirsch, what was your... Oh, what, you and I talked earlier, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, what was the most surprising information you've got during your career? Was, was, was there anything what destroyed your illusions about this world? In my what? In my, in my career? Uh, yeah. The most surprising information. What you've got like a journalist. You know, I'll answer that quick question by reversing it. What was the story you loved the most? And what I would say to that question is, I love all my stories like I love all my children the same. So I lost the capacity for surprise when I began to learn about the Vietnam War and the history. So I haven't been surprised by anything in a long time. I'm not surprised to learn that there is a little more depth to tr Trump is winning the war of the media. The tweets. You know what a kitty litter box is. The American press is playing in his kitty litter box with the tweets. He writes the tweets and everybody goes, Trump tweets this. And so he's driving the media. He controls them. Uh, he'll have two or three bad days and he'll say, I may not go to North Korea now. Trump announces he's not going to North Korea. And then he'll say, oh, I'm going to go. <laughs> But he knows, he, like a violinist, but playing a Stradivarius. He's got it. I can't answer that question because it involves um, uh, it involves being thoughtful, and it's sometimes it's not always good to be thoughtful before a large audience. You know, it, it, it's just not good. I'm not going to answer that question because I don't really know. I haven't thought about it. It's a great question, but I don't like <laughs> I don't like it's you know. You could, you could say about what I do for a living. You could say, so what does he do? What he does is he takes piece of people that think they're doing the right thing, and he goes, yeah, 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 I'm showing you up. So what's the psychological need for him to always show up other people, including presidents? You could do it that way too. I don't like to think that way. I don't like to think about why I do what I did, or why I became what I did. I don't know. But... It isn't so hard to say to yourself, well, what are the rules for getting married in Saudi Arabia, a second marriage, and discovering there's, there could be, you know, maybe as a favor to his family in Saudi Arabia, do official act, but there's no need. He could just go get married. He's divorced legally. Go get married. He doesn't have to do anything. So what if the Saudis may not declare it honorable? He's pretty much done with them anyway. He's been living in Washington, and he's not going to move to Istanbul. And then you can say that. You can say, well, why do you accept the story that he had to go to the embassy to get a document? As somebody said earlier, he'd gone in earlier and signed some documents. Why can't they just Federal Express it to him or send it by courier? Why does he have to go off when it's closed? And then why does the woman he loves not go in with him? But when she says that, he said, if something happens to me, call the cops. What a strange thing to say to her. What he would say is, I'm not going in this goddamn place. Something might happen to me. Let's get out of here. Or he'd say, come with me. The last thing he'd do was walk in. I sure wouldn't do that. He knew he wasn't popular. He was expendable once he talked about elections for the Muslim Brotherhood. He was expendable. Salman and Erdogan did not believe in elections. Erdogan fixed every election he had, and Salman doesn't have any. So, you know, if you start looking at it that way, heuristically, you know, just, you become, it's really hard to say, the only thing wrong with that equation is her. And then you begin to ask people who know. And if you ask some people who know, and they know you're smart, they'll answer me because they have respect for me. Because they know I've done some homework. And then you learn something that they learned. You know, our CIA director went to Inkerman last week, remember? Gina Haspel, by the way who did torture, who's also very bright, probably the best director they've had. You know, Gina Haspel is the new head of the CA. She's not a politician. She's very smart. She writes papers that are devastating. Thank God Trump doesn't read them. You can fire her. All right, I gotta go.
<laughs> oh so, two hours. Okay. So thank you so much, sir. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. But there's a little bit of celebration outside. Okay. So let's celebrate. It's beautiful. Yeah, I'll give it to you. Wait. Uh, I'll show you right over here.